Jules, tell us then, why is it important that we work in learning? Because we do work in, well, we produce insight and analysis for governments, for businesses, but why also do we work in learning? Uh, yeah, I think it's a, it's a good question to kick off the session with. Um, I think one of the key pieces is about the combination of these different activities. The Ellen MacArthur Foundation has a, a massive global mission to shift how the global economy functions. And in order to create that change in the industrial system, we need to work with all those different players and enable them to understand what this topic is, to apply it to their own context, and to ultimately create solutions, circular solutions at scale. And so um, if we were to just work in one sector, i.e. In, in business, we wouldn't be putting in place the uh, policy enablers that business requires to, to, to create that shift. And likewise, how we think shapes the world around us. And therefore, if we weren't working in the learning space, we wouldn't be enabling people to think differently and ultimately create new ways of doing things that are fundamentally different from the current linear system that we work within. So I think it's really key that we have those three key elements um, working um, together to create that, that, that massive change at this scale and pace that's required uh, today. I also think that the learning uh, work that we do is providing a context for people to go on that journey of discovery. And whether that's um, at a light touch way where you're just exploring a, a report, um, you know, you're, you're following a video link through the, through the diff, for example, that might lead you into a much more fundamental learning experience where you would start to build up that knowledge to the extent that you can apply it um, to your own, your own context, whether that be in business or in, in a, in a uh, for, more formal learning environment in a school or, or university. And I think we're going to touch on that whole continuum right across from schools through universities and in the business and professional context. Uh, maybe a warning for people at home, we'll use the jargon informal, formal learning. So formals like schools, universities, informal is more the type of stuff people might self go out, go out to, to, to learn for themselves, I guess what I'm saying. Yeah, and I think those terms are used um, in different contexts all over the world. But certainly with our work here, we, we tend to focus at schools and, and, and higher education as those spaces where, where learners are actively engaged in, in a context of um, gaining new knowledge, developing their skills, and ultimately preparing them for, uh, for their lives, um, their onward careers, and, and their, their role in society. So nine years old, the, the foundation. Uh, what on earth have you been doing in these last nine years in this learning space? Well, it's, it's we, Colin, right? I mean, we've been doing, doing a lot of this together over the last um, nine years. I think um, certainly from a learning point of view, the highlights have been that we, um, we started off very much in the school's realm. So we, we developed um, a field officer program, uh, which was uh, providing resources for, for, for um, school educators all over the UK of which half of, half of which were actively using our resources after two and a half years. We worked with curriculum developers and, um, and um, uh, exam providers uh, to, to, share, to share those, um, those teacher resources and, and, um, and really inspire uh, a generation to rethink uh, the future. I think our learning from that was that the scale and pace of change that we were able to achieve in, in that national curriculum work in the UK was just not significant enough. So we then moved more into the work um, with the International Baccalaureate and another um, much more global um, learning providers in, in that formal context. Universities have been very proactive in engaging in this space in terms of the applied research, um, in terms of the, um, the courses that they provide, both formal and, and, and informal, so accredited courses, world's first MBA, um, PG Cert, masters, um, many, many minors and electives all over the world. Um, <clears throat> and I think 
you know, one of the programs that we ran, we ran together for five years was the Smith MacArthur Fellowship, where we had students from all over the world coming together with their academic mentors to join us for five days. And those more transformational learning experiences where we're together physically and we're able to explore this to topic, develop the critical thinking around it, um, ignite that human ingenuity uh, that's required to, um, to address some of the major um, barriers around circular economy. I mean, that was a real highlight for me. And I think how do we create transformational learning at scale has al always been at the forefront of, mm. of our, our, um, our strategy. Yeah, but Jules, if you could boil down what we do in learning to three catchy uh, phrases or bullet points, what, what would they be? Um, well, I think that learning for a circular economy requires um, three key things. From my perspective, I think that a recognition that this is about motivating people. And I think we motivate them both through providing the, the rational insight and analysis and coherent economic um, articulation of the opportunities, as well as the emotional elements around the circular economy. What, are the, what is the human experience of going on this journey? And, and uh, what stories can we bring to life that really ignite many, many others to, to, to engage with it. And so I think motivation is a key element within any learning um, experience. And so how do we motivate people, I think is a, a key driver for our work. I also think that the fact that the circular economy is addressing some of the world's biggest global issues, obviously the climate change report we've just, um, we've just shared really articulates the role of production and consumption in addressing climate change uh, with nearly 50% allocated to, the, to that system of production and consumption when it comes to, to mitigating uh, climate change. So I think um, you know, there's the climate change piece, there's the waste agenda and how we can redesign systems so that they are much less wasteful. And I think also there's some, um, there's some clear links from a societal point of view and social perspective as well when, it looks, when we look at job creation and, and, um, and impacts more regionally uh, from a circular economy point of view. So all of those things create a sense of purpose. And I think, again, that's a key element that the circular economy provides is an individual's like, human sense of I have a role in, in a in a change agenda that I understand the direction of travel we're going on and, and how I can contribute to that. And I think the third element is about a systems approach. Mm. We talk about systems thinking a lot in our educational programs and throughout learning, we, we know that we have to enable people to think at the, the macro scale and to understand the big picture, um, but then also apply that in a more um, focus point of view and getting into the detail and the application and ultimately to develop the agility to move between those two mindsets. And so uh, that systems point of view I think is critical and I think will we'll come out in the rest of this session as well. Yeah, we'll come back to that in just a sec, but I wanted to pick up on this idea about the fact that we work with universities and the, the idea is out there in a way that it absolutely wasn't when we started this mission. Um, and, and of course, that means that we're going to come under a lot of critical analysis of, of the subject matter. I just wonder if there's any stories to tell of um, the reaction that we've had from various quarters when, when we, we start talking about a circular economy. Well, I think fundamentally the idea of moving from, from uh, a take-make-waste uh, economy to one that is regenerative and restorative by design is pretty undisputable. I think the 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 kind of pushback really comes in, why, well, how do we do that? And what does that look like in reality? Um, and there are massive barriers to achieving that, that level of change. And I think that's really where we are now in this, in this agenda is that the, the idea is becoming increasingly pervasive. Um, the three principles of the circular economy are becoming more understood. Um, and I think now we're getting into the space of really creating the, uh, the networks and the communities of practice that can get into the, okay, so how do we make this, this happen? Um, both physically in terms of the products and, and 
system services and infrastructure that we build, but also in terms of how we interact um, in, in, in supply chain management, in organizations and how they, how they function. Um, as, as human beings, how do we approach our, 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 our individual dynamics so that we can break out of the existing um, systems? And I think that critically, um, that systems approach is what is what um, is required with that w within that. And systems thinking is is a is a difficult topic to understand because it brings in understanding of complexity, complexity science. Um, and so that's again an, another potential barrier from an a educator and learning provider point of view is, is how do you actually tackle the, um, the complexity of the topic and make it tangible and relevant. Uh, and I think um, one of our speakers who's coming on um, uh, in, the, in the session later, Monica, will talk about this because that tension in a business context is, is really very, very live.